Okay. So I think we're going to get started. Um, I'm beginning to see people trickle in. So in the interest of time, I'm going to get us kicked off. This is a really great topic for us. It's something that's been really um, a topic of interest when it comes to EBCO. A lot of the categories we work on, whether that's food or pharma or cookware or spirits, um, really has a premium line or some kind of luxury line. And so we wanted to take a look at how those things are changing and how it might begin to manifest in different ways as we move forward in the next two or three years. So let's kick it off with a little bit of an icebreaker, and you feel free to answer in the chat as well if you've got any answers. So, Betsy, Sarah, what's the most premium or luxurious thing you've seen recently? Um, well, mine isn't a, a tangible good, but rather an, a bit of an experience. So um, Wanderlust has definitely gotten the best of me recently, and I've been getting uh, those feelings out by watching a little bit of the reluctant traveler with Eugene Levy. And uh, he visits a hotel called the Amangiri in Utah, which is kind of fantastic. It's this beautiful minimalistic resort, um, 34 rooms, middle of the desert. And uh, the rooms go for about between $4,000 and $12,000 a night. Wow. So, yeah. Very luxurious desert stay. For sure. How about you, Betsy? Yeah, this is probably a, maybe not the the whole answer, but one of the interesting things that I've been curious about and noticed more of is just the more of the life cycle of goods. And so the idea mm -hmm. of like Hermes, I didn't realize how much work goes into Hermes when you send products for like any type of like retanning or any type of service um, applied that can really help with the the goods feeling new again. Um, I think similar with Cartier. Um, mm -hmm. I think this whole idea of you buy something and you're buying it into an entire lifetime of of like high quality and craftsmanship, I think is a really interesting space mm -hmm. um, from the luxury lens that we're certainly seeing continue to evolve. But I think even to answer that for the premium, um, I think we're seeing a lot of that kind of similar mentality happening in the premium space um, related to goods being thought of kind of from an aftercare model um, mm -hmm. and either recirculated or just continuing to um, be mended and owned. And I think those are two really interesting models of kind of new luxury or new premium um, and really thinking about ways to um, more broadly, I guess, support the, the luxury model. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because my example was is probably the complete opposite. So I think definitely premium and luxury rests on this idea of craftsmanship and that it's going to last you a long time, so it's worth it. But then um, I think what I was thinking of was the Tiffany and Nike collab, which got mm -hmm. up the shoes, which got a lot of flack on social media. Um, apologies for anybody who liked it, but everybody was like, this is a very boring shoe. You just color the swoosh a different color. Um, and you know, it is kind of the opposite of that very basic um, craftsmanship idea because there is not a lot of, it doesn't feel like a lot of thought went into it. We're really relying on that brand name and the cachet of, of those two giants come together. And yet we've seen a, quite a few people buy it. it. It was quite a popular collaboration. So I think there are a few tensions that are really beginning to come out when we talk about premium and luxury. Mm -hmm. Just a great way to lead into my next question. How do you define luxury or premium to begin with? Is that kind of changing? Well, I think to build on both of what you said, obviously craftsmanship seems to be at the heart of it and how craftsmanship is being defined going forward, I think is the kind of crux of what I see changing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like craftsmanship and sustainability, as Betsy was calling out, are really becoming interwoven. Um, and there's this aspect of circular fashion that's coming up, um, as you guys were both talking about in terms of life cycle. Uh, I think it's within the, the um, sustainability aspect of it, I think there's also becoming a larger backlash to plastic-based fabrics being incorporated into luxury. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing a lot of natural fibers come through. So it's not just about sustainability in terms of supply chain, but also sustainability of fabrics, which is interesting to watch. For sure. I always think of like cost and craftsmanship um, 
And so I think typically luxury or premium goods exist in the top like quintile or maybe even top 10% um, of product cost ac- across a category. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also obviously having a great deal of craftsmanship and a very clear story in their articulation um, mm-hmm. that goes from basically end to end romance of how the product came to be. Um, and I think that type of transparency is something we also see as being more prevalent in other product categories or, or kind of down market products as well, mm-hmm. um, starting to adapt some of those types of, of trends. Um, but yeah, I think I did look up the economic <laughs> definition um, and I, I won't go deeply into it, but it has a lot to do with like supply and demand and when there is product available. So of course, scarcity plays mm-hmm. into to luxury as well. Um, but it's one of the things like the cost goes up as it becomes scarce and then looking at um, a, like very true uh, um, economic definitions of this. I didn't realize that it was actually something that's like quantifiable and a very clear Mm -hmm. market definition in terms of like a macroeconomic trend. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And yes, you did bring up that elephant in the room, which is basically premium (laughs) and luxury is expensive. Um, But I wonder, and maybe this is a question for the room, like how that's changing, because I do feel luxury and premium, you know, you justify the cost with that quality, but we're really beginning to see a lot of D2C brands, a lot of tech, especially enabled brands that are saying they can produce premium goods at a lower cost when they say, oh, we've cut out the middleman. If you see things like italic, you see things yeah. like um, uh, a lot of stores that just say we are direct consumer um, saying that we will give you premium without the price tag. Do you think that's something that resonates with consumers or is that kind of a bait and switch? Is that still premium? I think that's premium, um, but it may not be luxury. So I like the idea of teasing the two apart as we're talking about it, because Mm -hmm. I do feel like there's a a growing market of premium without having the label attached to it and people not necessarily caring as much about the label, not caring Mm -hmm. as much about the brand behind it, but it's Mm -hmm. more about what is this product made of? What are the qualities? So it's interesting to think about those implications overall for any industry, just where it's quality first, brand second, is this going to be a larger trend for us to pay attention to? Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I would do, Sarah. I think that, I think it definitely falls into the premium space because you are getting goods that have a great deal of craftsmanship involved um, in production. I, I haven't seen one of them break through where I'd qualify it as like a true luxury. For sure. Um, but they get a good way of thinking about it, even just on like a smaller scale, how to, how to create more premium products and really thinking through efficiency across the entire supply chain. Yeah, I think so. And so concretely, I think really the message coming out of this question for brands is really, especially if you play in the premium space, you know, you're no longer really re- able to rely on that name or that cost to justify this was for people to say and be proud of, I bought this $150 piece of equipment when you can, and increasingly the cloud comes from saying I got the same thing at $30 or $50 or $75 or whatever that cost might be. So finding a new base for premium to rest on is interesting. So let's take a look at a few big questions around luxury and premium. A lot of these are big social social shifts, but they do kind of trickle down into how brands manifest. Let's talk about the first one. Um, Everybody knows we're in pretty hard economic times. Um, the recession has been, is coming, is here, has been happening for years. How do you think that's changed luxury or premium products? Well, I have a really simple example, I'm sure, uh-huh. or thought, um, which is I think it just got a lot more comfortable. Um, <laughs> I think given the pandemic, um, it it and our love of athleisure wear, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of stemming into where we saw. I know we're going to talk about quiet um, luxury in a bit, but I see this whole kind of intersection of being at home, wanting to be comfortable, but wanting to still feel uh, like we have nice things around us. And those mm-hmm. two things came together to kind of redefine that space. 
Mm-hmm. The other thing I think is it's interesting um, where even during the pandemic, there was spending happening. And I, and I feel like that's mm-hmm. really highlighting this idea that luxury items is almost a form of escapism for mm-hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So no matter the difficult times that you're in or what you're faced with, having that, that splurge, that luxury item that you give gives you a sense of assurance, a sense of escapism, even when it might not be economically prudent for you to have purchased that good. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I was looking at the statistics around it and really interestingly, luxury has not True luxury, uh, let's start with that, has not really been hit by the recession. In fact, it grew. 95% of most luxury brands grew in 2022. um, And brands like uh, houses like LVMH actually had boom years when it came to the recession. And I think that does happen even in when you think about premium or middle class consumers. They're not necessarily buying a whole suite of LVMH, but they are thinking, I'm going to it's a lipstick effect, straightforwardly, right? I need something that makes me feel better, whether that is um, a branded lipstick from Dior. It's not a purse, but it's a lipstick. Um, Or whether that's avocado toast, whether that's the usual Starbucks run, right? We are looking for um, premium experiences. They just might be smaller premium experiences than that they might have been looking for previously. Yeah, that also reminds me of... um... The perfume category, which Mm -hmm. actually also saw a rise in sales during the pandemic, which is really interesting because perfume is kind of viewed as one of those ultimate luxury items. And Mm -hmm. here you are stuck at home, but you're buying Mm -hmm. perfume and you're wearing perfume again, I think, to give you that sense of normalcy, to give you that sense of escapism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also probably easier to wear perfume when you're not going into an office. <laughs> it's like something, it's like a form of self-care, mm. like nourishment. Um, I think there, I don't know if this is still true, but the the Birkins outperforming the market pretty consistently mm-hmm. as being like a better investment choice. I think a lot of, especially the super luxury space, um, can be really like heirloom style products if we're talking about. Yeah, a, a demographic that's not hit by the recession or economic times, um, like rougher economic times. I think that there, um, it also speaks to like bigger economic disparities between populations. Um, I think that's a really clear one that comes through when you think about um, shifting costs for like groceries, for example, or Mm-hmm. necessary goods versus sales of luxury. I think you see really clearly that the people being hit by economic forces are not the people that are are buying premium products. Yeah. So I think like a couple lessons coming out for brand here, and let me know if you guys agree or if you have any more. So one is definitely focusing on smaller ways for consumers to get involved with your brand, not necessarily focusing on those big bottles or like your big showcase items, but really smaller ones. Maybe it's a smaller pot. Maybe it is a smaller um, skew, right? That lets them still taste that and feel like they're indulging. But also like what Betsy was saying, this idea of being able to justify that purchase and saying this has a lot of craftsmanship behind it. This is a buy this once in my life item that is going to keep going for the rest of my years that is not going to weather as much as saying buying something that I is used once and loose, right? So being helping them justify those purchases and helping them reach those purchases are going to be more important, I think, for those harder economic times. And then of course, for those that are truly luxury, I guess shorthand, they really are not hit by this recession. So um, business as usual for many of the luxury brands. Um, speaking of luxury brands, who is buying this? How, how do we need to rethink the face of luxury or premium? What's the demographic here, do you guys think? So one of the interesting things I was looking at was, um, I think when we think of a lot of luxury and you still see it in their advertising, in their marketing, this tends to be predominantly Western, predominantly white, but looking at who is actually buying, and I think for a lot of premium brands, you already know this, a lot of these are Asian. So you're seeing quite a lot of Chinese consumers um, buying up stores. You're seeing a lot of uh, the rise of Indonesian and Indian markets as well, but also Gen Z. Um, How do you guys feel about that kind of shift? Do you think brands are lagging or kind of have their finger in the pulse when it comes to that? 
Well, interestingly, I think actually there's some new um, tech services that have come up to serve um, Mm -hmm. some of those markets. So I was just reading about um, a new service for Russians, for Russians to get luxury goods um, that are Western based. And it's essentially like a third party uh, that will purchase the items, repackage it and ship it for you. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think about um, global kind of accessibility within this, within the like changing face of it. And will our luxury brands, will our, um, all these channels of goods eventually be available to everyone globally? I think to touch on what you're saying, Catherine, about, you know, some of these other demographics outside of the U.S. and outside of Europe, how are they getting accessibility is really interesting to think about going forward. Yeah, I think one thing that really sparked a thought for me, Sarah, because um, again, um, in China, in Russia, and a lot of other places, I think the implication for brand here is that the person buying the item might not be the person using the item. So you have all these stories of um, my aunt, my cousin, somebody I know, or a service, um, a professional person is going into a store holding stuff up with their webcam and saying, do you want this? Do you like this color? Buying it for you and shipping it back. So this idea that I'm not necessarily communicating to the person in the store or having to make it easier for somebody who's looking online or in the store to pick an item for somebody else, I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think we see that with, um, like I think two areas, just making luxury more accessible um, would be like the second hand market. So you think of the like rebag and the real real as really driving accessibility across luxury products. Um, but I almost think like more interestingly, NFTs and the a lot of the fashion houses getting pretty involved in the metaverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a really interesting space where they're creating a lot more accessibility for their brand and letting people buy NFTs from their brand or buy skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and ways of kind of dabbling in a brand relationship, but without the scarcity model of a physical good. Um, and yeah. so it is one of those ways of ensuring that almost like grounding the brand, I guess, in a really nice way that allows people to meaningfully interact and grow a relationship without having to spend $20,000 on a handbag. Yeah. And I like this theme that's emerging through, we've talked about maybe four or five questions so far, this theme emerging about accessibility of the brand. How do we make premium more accessible to more people? How do you think that tension sits, or maybe this is a question that is up in the air for everybody. How does that tension sit with the idea that most premium, uh, a lot of the, the advantage of premium or luxury is that it's exclusive. Should luxury or premium become more exclusive or become more accessible? I think it should do both, but I think it's it's pretty complicated. Like I think the metaverse space or like the virtual goods space is a really great place for luxury brands to play. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think that brands like Hermes or Christian Louboutin should dilute their brands in ways that develop kind of more more midstream models because I do think that that changes the dynamics of a brand and their competitive advantages. Um, and so I think it's kind of an interesting space of how do you connect with people in a meaningful way that help, like, basically, how do you court your future consumer? <laughs> and I think previously it was like, at least when I was growing up, it was through like, reading Vogue and pulling out <laughs> like, <laughs> like the pages of the magazine. But um, I think now there are kind of more meaningful means of ownership um, mm-hmm. that can be interesting and kind of the equivalent. Um, and, but potentially more meaningful and more connective. Yeah. I think, I think there's one other aspect to, um, luxury that we should talk about, which is, you know, why beyond craftsmanship, beyond the brand reputation, what is it really supposed to be signaling this good, this item? And I think it's, you know, fashion has always played a fine line with art. And to me, this like luxury good represents an aspect of art, like you're buying wearable art. And Mm -hmm. so in that sense, um, when we think about the art world and we think about accessibility, right? Part of the reason that some art is valuable to you 
is because there's it's a limited edition, right? You might mm-hmm. there might only be one or there might only be a small set of it. Yeah. So I think inherently there has to be that tension of mm-hmm. limited accessibility with mm-hmm. luxury for in order for it to stay true to the kind of the initial intention of it being an aspect of art. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you guys is this idea of it's a hokey word. I know it's been used bandied around for a lot, but bear with me. The idea of purpose and not purpose as in this is my brand purpose, but purposeful accessibility almost that it's not open to everybody. But knowing that this particular subset is um, affluent, is able to afford it and finding ways to make it accessible to them, whether that is limited edition um, NFTs, whether that is a skin, whether that is art that appeals to that particular segment, right? Whether it's insp- inspiration that takes, um, that is local, um, a Chinese design or Indonesian design, all of that, um, being very purposeful about that. So it's still exclusive because if you're not part of that market then you're not interested in it, or it's clearly not for you um, to be able to maintain that aspect of exclusivity. Speaking of exclusivity, our favorite topic, uh, let's talk quiet luxury. What does that mean for those who might be on the call that somehow have not heard of quiet luxury? What, what is that? I, I think, well, I think initially it was mostly thought of through the terms of like product that's not optimized for social media. <laughs> <laughs> And so it tends to be things like baseball hats that don't have a logo on it. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of like floral piana, like cashmere's, mm-hmm. just unbranded clothes, I think that really signify high quality, but in the eye of the wearer versus signaling to everyone around them, mm-hmm. um, the a general aesthetic. Um, I think it has taken on almost new meaning to some degree where it's getting um, consolidated with like the old money Mm -hmm. um, aesthetic but I don't see them as the same thing at all and I think it does become a little bit problematic when you combine it with something like old money aesthetic Mm -hmm. yeah I'll I'll build on that I think for me um I would call it understated elegance Mm -hmm. um but to what Betsy's saying I, I totally agree I think there's a tension right now between it either being defined as kind of an old money aesthetic of ladies who lunch mm-hmm. kind of socialite aesthetic versus it being um, kind of what I was saying earlier is I, I also see it as a trend of um, really just like comfortability, right? Like mm-hmm. this notion of not wanting a maximalist style, but wanting to be a bit more minimalist, wanting to have these luxurious natural fabrics, like, cashmere and linen I feel like are the heroes of uh quiet luxury and and so I think there's this notion of of the two different feelings there like perhaps it's it's a sense of people wanting to not feel as loud when they go out don't want to have attention attributed to them want a bit more comfortable comfort and then um yeah is there a sense of you know, with the correlation of the popularity of succession, like, are you trying to also signal that you have a lot of money by some of these luxurious fabrics you wear? That's Mm -hmm. a question. Like, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think it's really based upon the wear. Yeah. I think where those two come together um, is around this idea of it's almost a secret language, a coded language, right? Um, Quiet luxury entails almost to some extent, trusting your customer, trusting that they will know that this is better quality, that you should be buying 100% cotton, that this is pure silk, all of that stuff without having to say it. And I think, you know, the the usual example for this is Bottega Veneta, right? They have logo-less brands, but the fact that they their weave is so distinctive lets people know, even without the brand name being on it, um, that this is a very expensive brand, that this is a very luxurious brand, right? So I think there is that leap that some brands are more comfortable making, being able to say like, I'm going to put this brand there. Um, I'm not going to splash it with logos, but I trust you to know that this is expensive. And 
to that extent, I trust the people around you to understand that what you're wearing is expensive, right? The linens, the, the suit that she wears in succession, right? To understand that these are expensive. And I think for brands, um, maybe that's a question we sit with. Do we have those kind of design signatures that I look at something and immediately know it is from this brand and therefore it is of that quality? Um, and I think maybe that's the only way you can engage with it that's not particularly problematic. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. I mean, I think the row is another really great example. Mm, uh -huh. You can spot any row product from, I think, a mile away just because you can see the drape and the, the seaming um, uh -huh. on their clothes. And it really does feel like a celebration and art. Um, yeah. But it's certainly not logoed or labeled. Um, where yeah. and they're all it's all neutral as well um so it's um that that's a good a good example I mean there are a lot that have just kind of traditionally stayed this course um and I think it has tended to pay off um yeah in the long term yeah how do you think that might manifest, and this might be a difficult question, for more premium goods so I think a lot of the products we work with food drink um beauty to some extent how does that manifest then do they uh, in terms of signature so I can think of at least materials beauty for example having really finely milled powder right or having this kind of glitter that's not terribly obvious right this kind of I guess like a quiet glitter place in blush mm -hmm. or in food in the type of organic farm race free trade all of that um, how else might that manifest I think um, for me, it, it comes out a lot in branding and just mm. implications for your brand. Mm -hmm. So I think we've been seeing it for a while now, but kind of neutral monotone palettes or weigh in, whether it's on clothing or through your branding, obviously um, being a bit less bold, I think for most brands, you know, they always have in their brand attributes. We want to be bold. And the question is, <laughs> how do you, do that in today's world where, where people maybe don't want as many loud things that they're looking at constantly. They want things to be a bit more subdued, a bit more easy on the eye. So I think those are key things to think through. Okay. I think with that, with like related to branding, I think we are seeing a bit of a return to um, like typewriter at ish fonts, like cream backing, um, mm -hmm with like back to to some degree maybe a serif um and i think we are starting to see some push in directions that do feel more minimalist more clean um, mm -hmm. but also not like innovation like an apple model but just clean and feel like they are more like crafts oriented so like handwriting type fonts mm -hmm. um, and typewriter fonts and things like that that all articulate this really nice attention to detail yeah, I think I saw somewhere that um, the fashion houses in particular are kind of coming back in terms of their logo. They had made it kind of more millennially, you know, very, um, uh, very the ordinary kind of branding. And they are going back to their more, well, for lack of a better word, fashionable logos, um, going back to their traditional roots. We're seeing things like Burberry talking about like the return to British fashion. So really, um, maybe for those brands that are older actually it's this rebranding into classic and to really appealing um, rather than trying to chase after that kind of more millennial um vibe I think that um, yeah. oh sorry I was just gonna say like Banana Republic I think is a good example of what of a mm. traditional brand that's really trying to become more premium and less of a discount um, yeah. retailer but they've done a really nice Kind of turnaround of doing that by going back to their archives and re-embracing some of the mm -hmm. styles that they previously developed mm -hmm. um, and it seems like they're being really successful and might have i mean j crew similarly um yeah. like just finding going back to their roots and finding ways of developing um i think new products that really embrace their old kind of touchstones yeah um, i think that's another way of seeing kind of premium or kind of more mainstream brands really embracing the idea of luxury. Yeah. So let's talk about a bit of the elephant in the room, almost at a, maybe it's this polarizing tension. Maybe it's the opposite. How about eating the rich? How does that sit with how luxury and premium are changing? Like to me, I think 
regardless of where it comes from, it does stem from that idea of we want to be the rich, but we also love to hate the rich. Um, there is this weird tension about how do I deal with it? But I think at the end of the day, it actually still lands in the same place as quiet luxury, where you don't want to flaunt your money. You don't want to flaunt it in the face of people who might get mad at you, who might kind of tear you down on social media, but you still want to be rich. And so you see, again, that rise of uh, coded language where the things you buy are still premium, but not things you necessarily want to kind of be flaunting everywhere. And I think probably the best example of how eating the rich isn't so much about turning your back on premium is that the Four Seasons, which was on White Lotus, is now booked out for like years <laughs> in the future. So yes, we love to hate on them, but I don't think it necessarily means people are turning away completely from the idea of premium or luxury. How about you guys? No, I think you're spot on. I think one of the the things with um, this piece that we might we might see continue to evolve, especially if we are in a more recessionary environment long term, or just more global instability, will be the return of the just brown shopping bag mm. uh, and less logos on products. But I don't think that the luxury market overall will evolve. I mean, I do think that it's shown that it's pretty resilient. Um, mm as long as a certain percentage of the population can still buy it. Um, but I do think there's a certain level of signaling that you'll see. I don't know. I remember the recession of 2008. Um, several brands were rolling out just brown shopping bags to prevent people from being ridiculed that are still buying while others suffer. And I think that will continue and we'll see a lot less branded um, kind of products associated with the shopping experience. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think definitely less bling is probably the way to go now. I think the point of bling for a long time has been to put it on social media. And so you have those influencers saying, I am drinking this very expensive spirit while sitting in my private plane. And now those have been kind of exactly become objects of ridicule. So now it's it's again going back to that coded language. If I'm going to post it and those of my friends who know will understand, but um, people watching from a distance or, you know, gawking would not. Okay. So kind of a flip, kind of a breath of fresh air. How about 3D printing or AI? Let's talk process. How has that changed premium? Yeah, I, I think there's some really interesting things happening in this space. I was just reading about um, an AI fashion week that happened. Oh, and wow. um, all of the, uh, the lines that were shown were obviously created um, in this virtual universe and people could choose the kind of models that they put it on um they could even put it on aliens if they wanted to right um but what was interesting for me was that people were using uh platforms like mid journey to create these oh. visions and it was kind of this um amalgamation of their own creativity mixed with this new super ai oh. power um i have this great quote that i wanted to share along that just yeah. on the sense of creativity from one of the designers. Um, she said, I've used it to essentially collaborate with myself, but in a way I see it almost as if you're collaborating with the collective consciousness of all humanity. And that's something that's really exciting to explore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, this is so interesting to think about. On one hand, as I was reading this and reading about it, I, I had this feeling of, is this going to make fashion bland and unoriginal because it's all going to be kind of this automated AI creating it? Mm -hmm. But after I read her perspective, it gave me a new spin that is it potentially kind of supercharging your own creativity, your own creative process? Whereas like before, maybe um, we're flipping through books of artists and things like that to get excited and here it's that you're like working with another super brain where you're passing ideas and you're collaborating with yourself with something really interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether artists or de designers lend their IP um, within this model, because I think we're seeing it a little bit in the music model as it relates to like Grime saying anyone can use her. Um, yeah, and then also I think 
um, didn't Kanye do one that was like a Donda? His record wasn't he letting anyone sample his music? Um, I think someone sampled it. I don't know if they yeah. were allowed to do it. But okay, somebody- I don't know. But <laughs> I think there could be something interesting as it relates to if you took the same like music idea and applied it to artists and designers. I wonder if there could be something interesting where people get to personalize products in a meaningful way and then potentially have them created. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I think that could be kind of an interesting way of infusing creative expression within a designer's IP. Um, It could be a really interesting way of, like Sarah was saying, like merging the and collaborating uh, in really creative and interesting ways. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of collaboration really beginning to make its way into premium. Um, You know, I think a lot of the time we were talking about it earlier, like a lot of premium rests in the idea of exclusivity and a craftsmanship and this shifting idea that maybe premium can now become something that the customer takes a part in or that art or creativity is the primary source of luxury because then if I can 3D print anything, then it's not so much craftsmanship. It's not so much this long, years long uh, wait to for a new watch, right? It really rests on this is the most creative watch, not the watch that took the longest to make. So I think there's a really interesting um, tension there. I wonder though if that will further premium like mm. the luxury market because you do see like when every new visual technology is advanced like it puts more of a premium on painting like the the cameras invented and then all of a sudden painting is becoming mm. something that's more revered um yeah. reviewed from more of a, a craftsmanship perspective and I wonder if we could see a similar piece there where the it's almost like the mid-tier is the one that's being disrupted mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. So kind of a polarization. So for brands looking into 3D printing and AI, kind of deciding where to make that bet. Am I going to lean heavily into the fact that I push out collaborations every quarter where I let the customer collaborate with me, where I've got pop-up 3D printing shops, or do I lean very heavily into traditional premium where we talk about things being handmade or generations of craftsmen um, made, and then just needing to choose a lane? Mm-hmm. Okay. Speaking of tech, we talked about this a little earlier, but just to see if you've got anything else to add, how about NFTs and the metaverse? Is it time for premium to enter the metaverse or do we hold off? I know this well, is <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know Betsy has a lot to say on this. Um, but I think when we talk about, and Betsy, you touched on this earlier, but the audience in the face of luxury and premium and where is that changing? I think beyond different parts of the world and the, the, you know, those, those areas tapping into um, some more Western luxury brands, I think Gen Z, right? Like how is Gen Z playing into premium and luxury? And Betsy, you already touched on this, but I think NFTs are really the way that uh, luxury brands are starting to speak to Gen Z today. Um, So I was looking at Prada, for instance, they created something called Time Capsule, Mm. started in 2019, um, but they set it up so the first Thursday of every month, uh, they have this uh, this good that is paired with a a physical good that is paired with an NFT that's only available for 24 hours. And most recently, um, kind of in the realm of quiet luxury, it was quiet luxury meets street style. It was like unisex tank tops with a little bit of street style, basketball flavor, basketball jersey. But Mm -hmm. then it was also made with upcycled fabric. So it was kind of combining all these different things that we're talking about then with an NFT. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting was the NFT so far has been free. It's really been the physical good that you're paying for. And then you get this NFT for free. And so Betsy, I'm curious to hear like your thoughts, if you're starting to see um, people paying more for the NFTs in the, from the luxury brands, because so far what I've seen has really just been NFTs are an additional freebie um, Mm -hmm. in addition to the physical good. Yeah, I think in the short term, I think that's probably the the best way to go. I mean, some brands have tried to sell, um, I think. Maybe it was Corvette. I don't, one of the car manufacturers tried to auction off an NFT. 
and um, ended up being like just massively embarrassed because it didn't, they didn't have a single bidder. Yeah. Um, and I think there is some, I mean, I think consumers are smart, even if they are impulsive. And <laughs> I think asking someone to pay for an NFT that doesn't have really clear utility is a real challenge. Um, but I do think that a lot of the NFT usage today is a means to build community and to build a, a stronger relationship with the consumer. Um, and so I think it will open up to additional monetization streams over time. Um, Allo Yoga is probably a good one where they do, um, they sell the product, but it, it has an NFT and a digital twin um, to think about the life cycle of the product and maintenance of the product. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an interesting example of, although you can't necessarily charge a premium on the product, it does allow you to stay engaged with the customer beyond like a CRM <laughs> platform that might not be as exciting um, or as engaging as they were 10 years ago. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's, it's a, a nice way of embracing a new touch point. But I do think that they will be sold um, in the future. And then, of course, in the gaming space, they are sold. Um, frequently so yeah I think that um that's something that that will continue like if it if it's a skin or something that you could actually like meaningfully interact with then I think you can sell that but just the NFT itself is a real challenge right now for sure. one other twist I wanted to put out there that's interesting for us to think about with NFTs and where they're going is could they also be an extension of people um they want to purchase, they want to buy things, but they're also trying to be sustainable. So it's like a way to get an aspect of this luxury brand without buying into um, a waste stream. I think that's something really interesting to think about because all these brands um, that I've been looking at are really prioritizing sustainability, these luxury brands. And I wonder if long-term strategy, they're thinking about we get people used to NFTs where, mm -hmm. and thereby we're meeting our CSR initiatives while also um, increasing our revenue by adding this new good, this new good of NFT. Mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about. Yeah, for yeah. sure. There is an entire kind of territory around aspirational ownership. Um, and just that idea, especially for people that are actively engaged in Roblox or one of the gaming platforms, um, getting more satisfaction out of their digital goods than physical ones. And so you see them starting to spend more of the disposable income on, on virtual goods, which I think is something that surprises um, people that aren't actively involved in video games, but mm -hmm. um, it's certainly driving a lot of growth for, um, for those that are. And I think that as we see that kind of continue to evolve, we will see other, um, other motivations and reasons to to buy virtual goods in lieu of a physical one yeah speaking of physical versus virtual versus other goods how about the rise of experience over things right and that kind of maybe nfts and the metaverse are the most extreme version right where i don't have that physical item but um even closer in how do you think that's changed the face of premium or luxury I think it extends the relationship in a pretty interesting way. Like a lot of luxury brands also offer an experiential element to a purchase mm -hmm. uh, that I think is really smart. Um, and so oftentimes you're getting educated on the, the craftsmanship and on the, the person, even going as far as um, the artisans that are making the products. And I think then really pushing into a physical good with an experiential um, element is mm -hmm. kind of an interesting space where we saw brands reacting pretty quickly um, to to really meet this need. Um, and then as Sarah said, Amangiri, of course, is the ultimate um, yeah. ultimate experience because it's also like photographed constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, something you wouldn't go there without putting it on your Instagram, I would think. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it For becomes sure. uh, bragging rights and signaling as well. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it fits the quiet luxury vibe too. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. I think to build on what Betsy's saying, it, it almost seems like experience has to be part of the shopping experience. Like there has to be something bigger happening in and around your physical good. 
Um, one thing I saw that was kind of interesting was coach recently launched a new, um, AR, uh, kind of virtual try on window outside of their store. So as people are walking by, it's kind of this digital moving billboard where it's, it captures you and then it starts to overlay contextual things on top of you to kind of drive you into the store, make you more interested in what's happening. But obviously it's this huge amount of tech infrastructure built around just trying to get someone into store, building an experience that feels unique to them. It brings me back to the days of um, years ago, going into Glossier um, down in uh, LA and being super wowed by in the back. Once you go through the store, there's this huge tunnel that's purely meant for you to go in there and, and take photos of yourself in this very um, well-designed tunnel. Um, after you have tried on your makeup, of course. So you go in, you put on your face and then you go in the back and you're in this weird, like virtual, you know, cool world they set up where you're taking pictures of yourself. So I think um, it's just become the norm, right? Like, I don't think this is anything terribly new, but it's definitely gonna become more of the norm where if we're getting people to go in store, they really want to have an experience. It's not just about, oh, I'm going in to pick up this thing. I want to go have an experience with the brand. I want something unique to happen that I couldn't get from going online. Yeah. And I think like what's really interesting is that the experience isn't only about experiencing the brand's front face, real face, I suppose. Um, There's also this element of people of being able to offer now the experience of going behind the scenes and having that experience. So if you think about Starbucks Odyssey, which is kind of the premium reward system that Starbucks just launched, um, a lot of their a lot of their perks are surprisingly, they do not offer free coffee. They have eliminated that in their premium rewards. And it's really all about experiencing the brand in other ways. So for example, being able to go to a coffee farm um, that Starbucks runs and being able to experience that, going to coffee classes so you can learn about cupping and you can learn about the process of making coffee, right? This, this really interesting field opening up for luxury or premium where you're taking people behind the scenes and that feels premium because it's so exclusive. Mm-hmm. And we're nearing the end, but so let's talk about the people in the extremes. Let's talk about Gen Z because, and I know it sounds like Gen Z is very young. I think in my head, I've kept them at like children, but Gen Z, the eldest is actually already in their twenties, um, early twenties. So they are increasingly people who are engaged in the premium and luxury category. Um, studies have shown they actually get engaged in these categories five years before the millennials did. So in their teens, they're already kind of focused on that. And maybe it's driven by this. Um, what do you guys think about this statement that our parents' generation were keeping up with the neighbors across the street, but Gen Z today are keeping up with the Kardashians. What does that mean? Well, funny enough, I I mean, I think in part, of course, this is true, but I think there's also a backlash mm. to, um, for Gen Z to the Kardashians. I was reading um, online, one um, person was commenting on how the Kardashians have these warehouses full of clothing that they keep. And it's like these insanely huge warehouses that they say, oh, we're keeping our clothes for our kids. But it's like the kids could never even get through those clothes in their lifetime if they wanted to. And Mm -hmm. so I think, again, it's this sense of um, going back to like eat the rich. It's almost a sense of like wealth hoarding and like, why do you have all these things Mm -hmm. um, versus being more conscientious of your spending and conscientious of your really um your waste flows i think this is very important for gen z we know sustainability is like perhaps the number one value for them so mm-hmm. i think there there is something to say about um gen z likes these fashion brands but they really want them to come across as promoting this sense of sustainability it doesn't mean quiet luxury necessarily i think it's something separate i think it's what um is being called as expressive luxury Mm -hmm. you know they still be able to express their individuality whereas i agree like millennials are kind of more drawn to that quiet luxury i Mm -hmm. think um having the ability to be very expressive with your style is is definitely 
top of mind for Gen Z, but they want that expressiveness to be paired with sustainability. So it's kind of a different way from what we were talking about in terms of, um, you know, natural fabrics. Here, I think what's happening is we're looking at um, things like Coach Topia, which was specifically launched for Gen Z, where it's a line of handbags made from um, recycled materials. Then you have Stella McCartney, who um, partnered with an organization called Protein Evolution uh, that's really meant to take fabrics and recycle them. And I think that is kind of where I see the correlation with Gen Z, where it's more about that that circular waste stream versus using natural fabrics mm-hmm. that's happening in quiet luxury. I do think though the social media yeah. lens is an important one to look at in this space because as you're thinking about your, I don't know, like youth is so plagued by comparison. And I think if you're thinking about comparison to kids in your high school or kids in your college, um, it's a completely different set of circumstances and set of guidelines for what's acceptable behavior if you're trying to fit in. And I think that um, that feels like to some degree for my kids, I'm thinking like that feels manageable and safe. (laughs) I mean, as you do expand and regardless of of like what the influence is, I think as the influences get bigger, um, then you do see kind of demands start to change and what expectations are or what normal is does shift pretty profoundly. Um, And I think if we're not comparing it to the Kardashians, we're still comparing it's probably someone that didn't, that wouldn't identify with Mm -hmm. the the trends happening at your high school (laughs) or the trends happening at your college. And so I think there is this like aspirational element that has become normalized Mm -hmm. um, that can drive um, kind of consumerism, especially for these luxury goods, um, when you don't have the disposable income, but you are prioritizing things a bit differently in order to be able to afford them because it feels normal to you. Yeah, I think so. Just this kind of widening, I think, of influence, right? Mm -hmm. I'm no longer, if I'm on TikTok, it's exactly, I'm not necessarily only looking at my high school. I'm also looking at really cool teens um, in Japan, or I'm looking Mm -hmm. at really cool teens living in Sweden and trying to copy that kind of premium aesthetic. Um, It's really interesting. So we're coming up at the end of time. So let's just spend a couple of times talking about a really interesting topic that a lot of brands have come to us asking about you know, this challenge of Amazon, thrifting, dupes, what do you think brands should do about these kinds of things? What does it mean for premium? I'm excited. I mean, I'm excited about the power of like authentication of Mm -hmm. products on blockchain. I think that will be really huge, especially on a lot of these goods that do um, become more luxury over time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's going to be a really interesting space and one that will accelerate pretty rapidly, Um, especially when we think about like a lot of the resale sites Mm -hmm. Um, and just knowing that you are buying a genuine product and then being able to continue to pay homage to some degree to that brand, I think is really important. For sure. Um, I think for me, like, what's really exciting in this space is these Amazon, this thrifting, these dupes by nature, they have very low margins as compared to something like luxury or premium, which has much higher. So being able to go back to your capabilities. And I think what we found over and over for our premium brands is the importance of service, the importance of concierge, really being able to, like Betsy said in the beginning of this call, um, to take the time to repair, to take the time to white glove service, anything you need. And I think that will increasingly become the differentiating factor um, when we think about really premium, really luxury brands. Okay. And in the last couple minutes, one statement each, what change are you most excited about when it comes to premium and luxury? If you had a project, what would be the coolest thing to work on? Luxury travel. (laughs) No, I mean, I thought White Lotus, since you mentioned it, Mm -hmm. um, was it incredible. To me, it felt felt a little bit like sci-fi predicting a shift. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's going to be really hard to stay at a Four Seasons property in a future scenario where you know so so little of your money is actually being fueled to the local economy. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so I'd be really interested in studying how, how the like luxury hotel market will change over time. Um, well, I think I'll go back to what I was saying all along, which I'm really excited about um, craftsmanship going forward. I think being uh, interchanged with sustainability and that the two are going to inherently be linked going forward. Um, it's going to be a requirement. And it's not going to be a nice to have. So looking forward to those shifts. Yeah, I think I'm pretty excited about how price is increasingly getting pushed out of the equation when you think about premium, although of course in luxury it will still remain the idea of anybody being able to create something that feels premium with 3D printing, with the rise of tech, with the rise of AI or uh, mid-journey, thinking about how that those things are going to change luxury is really interesting. And we are just at time. So I want to thank you guys for being on the call with me. I learned so much from the two of you, um, and I'm sure our audience did as well. If you guys have any questions, please just reach out to me, and I'm happy to noodle even longer on this topic. But thank you all, and have a great Friday.